Okay. So we're done technically with chapter four, seven, and eight, which is the coverage of your second exam. And later on, you're going to have a chapter seven and eight quiz that you have to take using lockdown respondus or respondus lockdown. Uh, you have until the after uh, before class next Thursday. And then on Thursday, in between Thursday and uh, Tuesday, you're also going to take a chapter, uh, no, not a chapter, an exam to dry run. Okay, so that by Tuesday next week, we have all the time to do the review, answer everything that needs to be answered. Okay, so we're going to proceed with chapter nine because we need to, okay. But the coverage of their exam is just four, seven, and eight. Okay, so we just need to proceed on what we have because uh, this is the thing. If we still have extra time at the end, okay, this will be helpful for those who are struggling in class. So there's a reason why I need to move on because if I'm going to have some extra time, I can utilize that extra time to help other students. Okay, who are, uh, let's say, uh, struggling in class. And then later on, I, I play on a video about how to book an appointment for the uh, tutoring service. We have tutoring service, as I've told you, and I already posted the schedule that they have in our Blackboard. Okay, so what we're going to do today is just chapter nine. We already have this concept before in chapter two, okay? But this is not indirectly discussed about it. What we have discussed about ionic and covalent in chapter two is what? Ionic compound, covalent compound, okay? But if you're going to look at the difference between them, it has something to do with the so-called bonding. So unfortunately, I lost my pen. <laughs> I cannot write right now the writing part that, that I usually do but it's just for this uh, meeting. So we have here what we call bonding, okay? So whenever we hear the word bonding, usually what's the uh, thing that comes out to your mind? Okay, anyone? When you have called about bonding, bond, like me, I have bond to you, okay? You are Connect. my students. Connection. A connection. Okay. So whenever you have bond, you have what we call connection. Reaction, I'm not really sure if that's a, that's how it is. Okay. Because if you reaction, you mean, ah. Okay. So that's not a good, uh, what we call bonding that you have. Okay. So in the chemical world, we also connotate bond as some sort of a connection, okay? In fact, this is the one that hold the atoms together or connect atoms together. So they said there's a chemical bond, which is a strong attractive force that exists between certain atoms in a substance. And if we're going to look at this, there are at least three bonds that comes to, uh, chemical bonds, okay? So we have this ionic bond, covalent bond, and metallic bond. So if we're going to look at this uh, bond that we have here, so we have ionic, covalent, and metallic bond. So if we're going to look at this, I have to use the whiteboard because I cannot uh, write. So when we're talking about ionic, okay? So this is the bond between a metal and a non-metal. So we could say that ionic bond is formed when you have a metal and a non-metal, okay? Ionic bond is formed when the metal loses an electron and a non-metal gains 
an electron. So when a metal lose an electron, what happened? It becomes positively charged. Okay? And when the non-metal gains electron, it becomes negatively charged. So that opposite charge that you have, that's the attraction that results to the formation of this ionic bond. Okay? So if you're going to look at ionic bond, this is a chemical bond formed by the electrostatic attraction between positive and negative ions. Okay? So ionic bonds forms when one or more electrons are transferred from the valence shell of one atom uh, to the valence shell of another atom. So as I have told you, metals, they lose electrons, become positively charged. Non-metals gain electrons, become negatively charged. So if you're going to look at what we have learned in chapter 8, so we have this electron configuration okay so when you lose this electron what happened your configurations become similar to that of a noble gas and when you gain an electron this configuration is also similar to a noble gas okay so the one that becomes positive charge that is the cation that's the atom that uh, lost an electron. The one that is uh, what we call a negative, uh, the one that uh, becomes a negative charge, the one that gains electron, that is the anion. Okay? So that is the ionic bond. So before I proceed, let's go on the other bonds that we have there. So I told you I don't have my pen, so it's it's really, really hard for me to write something here. Okay, so when we go to covalent, it's just like my daughter in kindergarten. Okay, so covalent is an interaction between non-metal and another non-metal okay so that is covalent bond so if we're going to look at the covalent bond okay what happened here is instead of electrons being exchanged what happened electrons are being shared in this uh, what we call bonding okay so covalent bond, you know from the naming, we use what? Prefixes. Okay. So it tells us how many uh, non-metals binds with another non-metal. So that is the covalent bond. Now the last one that we have there is the metallic one. So if you're going to look at the uh, philosophy here, so ionic is metal and non-metal. Covalent is non-metal and non-metal. Metallic is the bond metallic that holds metallic. the metals together. Okay. So this is within the metals. Okay. So they have a, spe a, a specialized bonder that hold metals together. What's the unique property of metal? Anyone? What makes metal unique? Conductors. Okay, they conduct electricity. Okay, now their ability to conduct electricity has something to do with the presence of this so-called sea of electrons. Yeah, I lost it this more uh, yesterday afternoon. I have a class. The, uh, yesterday morning and then I, I just can't find the, uh, where the pen is so I ordered a replacement and it will arrive tomorrow morning okay so next meeting we already have the pen thing so the sea of electrons allow metals to conduct electricity okay and you will learn 
that the main reason why you can conduct electricity is just due to the presence of charges. And where do we get these charges? We get it from electrons. You can have an excess or deficient of electrons and it resulted in charges. Now, what's the thing that we need to learn about this bonding that we have here? Okay, so in the periodic table, you have there the groupings, group 1A, group 2A, 3A, 4A, okay? Now, those group numbers there, especially for representative elements, they had a lot of uses, okay? And one uses that they have is this use of this Lewis electron dot symbol. So if you have this Lewis electron dot symbol, this is just a notation in which the electrons in the valence shell of an atom or ion are represented by dots placed around the chemical symbol of the element. So when you have a Lewis dot symbol or Lewis electron dot symbol, it consists of an element and the dots that represents the number of valence electrons. And the way that they look at it, okay? So if you are given let's say the element like this okay so the dots can be put in the four corners or four sides of a given element so for instance we have an e so if you're going to look at an e What's the group number of Ne? Neon. Anyone? 8A. Eight, eh? eight. Okay. 8. So how do you represent the 8 that's there? So you put that's here, that's here, that's here, that here. Just imagine that's a dot, okay? Because <laughs> it's really hard for me to write it. Another dot here, another dot, and another dot. Okay? So you have there the eight dots. Now you may ask, why eight? What makes eight unique? Okay? So if we're going to look at the Lewis symbol that we have here, so this is how we illustrate the Lewis electron dot symbols for second and third period atoms. What does this mean? So if you have group 1A, you have there one electron. And usually your guide there is the S1, the NS1. N is the principal quantum number. If you have group 2A, you have there NS2. Now, if you have 3A, so you have now the S being filled and the P start to being half filled. And then 4A, you have the 4, and then 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. So the number of dots that you have there is just based on the group number. Okay? And you might ask, why 8? Because you are feeling there, what orbitals? Your valence shell. Yep, yeah, but what orbitals are you feeling there? What letter are the orbitals you're filling up? P. S and P. The S and the P. Why eight? Because an S would have two electrons at most, and P has six electrons at most. You add them, you get eight as the maximum that you can have, okay? Because if you introduce another one after eight, you're going to have now a much higher orbital or an orbital with a higher energy level, okay? So you remember what happened here? When you remove your valence electron there, which is your uh, sodium, it becomes isoelectronic with neon. 
So when we say isoelectronic, they have the same electronic configuration. So your Na plus there, it has the same electron configuration with muon. Okay? So let's try to represent here the transfer of electrons in forming calcium oxide from atoms. So how are we going to do this? Uh, how are we going to do this? How are we going to show the transformation or the transfer of electrons? Okay. So we have the calcium, right? And then we have the oxygen. How many valence electron does calcium has? Two. Okay, it's two. So that means you have two dots. So you can place any side the number of dots that you have. But the way that they do it is one dot at a time in one side. How about oxygen? How many dots do you have for oxygen? Or how many electrons, valence electrons, do you have for oxygen? Seven. Is it seven? Four. Six. Four? Six. Give me a number. Six. Four. Six. <laughs> Six. So it is one, two, three, four, five, Six. Now you may ask, Professor, why six? What will be my answer? Look at the group number of oxygen. Convince? I have a question. Is the way the dots are arranged important at all, or you can just put them? I, I, I told you, as long as you put two at the uh, at, at each side, you're you're, you're fine. Okay. Okay, as long as you try to do it like uh, Hans rule, half filled before uh, you fill them up. Half mm. filled first, one by one. Okay. okay. So, how will be the exchange of electrons happen here? So which one will give up? Will oxygen give up with six electrons? Or will calcium will give up two electrons? Calcium. Calcium. Okay. Or calcium. will calcium accept the six electron or oxygen will accept the two electrons? Those are the things that uh, you need to consider here. So if you remember from our previous uh, discussion about the periodic table, metals, they tend to give up their electrons. Okay. So what happened? These electrons can go on this side, and these electrons can go on this side. And when that happens, this becomes what? So it lost two electrons, so it becomes? Plus. Plus. Calcium two plus. Now, oxygen, on the other hand, what happened now? It gained two, so it's like minus two. Okay, so it, since it gains two electrons that are both positive, this is now negative two or two minus. I just put that two minus. That is your ionic compound. You form the, uh, the, the ionic bond because of the interstatic uh, forces between the positive charge and the negative charge. Okay? So question on that. Okay, 
So that's how we represent the formation of calcium oxide through the transfer of electrons. So the transfer is from calcium going to oxygen. Okay. Now, let's try to look at the energetics in this formation of ionic compounds. So when, we when I'm talking about energetics, the energy that is involved in the formation of this uh, ionic compound. So for instance, if you're going to look at how these ionic compounds are formed, we have two terms that we already discussed during our last chapter. We have the ionization and electron affinity. So what do we say? Ionization is the energy to remove an electron, right? And usually this involves the metals. Now, electron affinity on the other hand, this is the energy to add an electron. And this involves, uh, we could say, the nonmetals. Now, in both process, wherein you remove an electron and you add an electron, what can you say about the energy? It's equal. Is it equal? Now, what can you say about the energy? Do you have to supply it? or it is given up by this process. Okay. So what do you say? It is, is energy required or energy released for this process energy to happen? Is, released. is the energy released here? If you want to remove an electron from a metal, is energy released there? No, it's required there. That, 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 That's what I'm talking about. So if you want to remove an electron from a metal, do you need energy or the energy will be released when you, uh, you what we call, uh, remove an electron? Need energy. Okay? You, you need, need energy, energy, right? Now, how about the other one? When you have a non-metal and you add an electron, is the energy released there? Or you need the energy to put the electron to the non-metal? What can you say? In both sequence that we have here, energy is needed. Okay? So the term that they have there is endothermic. You need energy into the system. Because if you don't supply the energy, the the electron will not be removed out of the metal and the electron will not be added into the non-metal. Do, do you get what I mean? Okay. The combination of ionization energy and electron affinity is endothermic. What does it mean? It requires energy. Okay. But they notice when the two ion bond, okay, more than enough energy is released. So what does it mean? When they combine, okay, a, a, a metal and a non-metal, most of the reaction release energy. Where in the first place, the initial step that you have there required energy. Okay? So how does this happen? So if we're going to look at the lattice energy, so we said lattice energy, this is the change in energy that occurs when an ionic solid is separated into gas phase ions, okay? So lattice energy, this is the energy that is involved in the formation of ionic compound. So if we're going to look at the uh, uh, lattice energy, this is the energy required to completely separate one mole of a solid ionic compound into a gaseous ions, okay? Now, there's a problem with the lattice energy. 
you cannot measure them directly. Okay? It can be, however, be uh, determined by using the changes in energy steps. Okay? That gives the same result. So we could say there is no direct measurement of lattice energy. But you can still obtain lattice energy, okay, by using the different steps that is happening, looking at the energy that is involved in this different step. Okay. Now, what is these steps? So let's see how an NACL is formed. Or let's see how we determine the lattice energy of sodium chloride. So what are the different steps? So if we're going to look at the one step formation of sodium chloride from sodium and chlorine, this is that one step. 639 kilojoules, negative 639. So that means the energy is released. That's why it's negative. Okay? But if you're going to make a step-by-step -step here, so you could see here, this is the first step. So the first step is the conversion of Na to Na+. Plus, and that is your what? Na to Na+. Plus, what is this? What is the energy associated to it? Anyone? Ionization. Ionization energy. Okay, now Cl to Cl minus. What's the I associated energy on that? The electron affinity. That's the electron affinity. Now, as you could see, both of them are positive. Okay, but once you reach that state where both of them now are ions, okay, what happened is it can be a multi-step where when they form into ions, they form into an ion pair, or it's just a one step wherein the ions will become an ionic compound. And both these processes are what? Energy releasing. Okay? So if you're going to look at the one step process from uh, the ionic or the ions forming into an ionic compound that's involves around negative 786 kilojoule. But if it's a multi-step where your ions become an ion pair first, so that's a negative 493 uh, energy releasing process. And then the next step that you have there, your ion pairs will now become an ionic compound. And that involves another to a negative 293 releasing compound, or what we call <laughs> releasing energy. But if you're going to add this, 493 and 293 just gives you what? Negative 786. And if you're going to consider the amount of energy that released with the amount of energy that was spent, okay? that is equals to this value. Try, convince yourself. So there's always equal amounts of energy released. Okay, so as I've told you, we don't have any way or any means to measure this directly, right? But we can get the value Okay, in the chains from this going to this. How did we do that? We look at the different step. So all I need you to, to do is convince yourself that when you add this number with this one, you get this. Try, try to use your calculator. Or you could say, add this two, negative 493 and negative 293, which will give you this. And then you add it with the positive 147 and you will still end up with 600, negative 639. 
I got that. Okay. So what you have here is an indirect means to determine the energy chains. Okay. Now they have a term for this. They have a term for this and the term that they have here is Heslow. Heslow is if you sum up all the process, it will give you, okay? The one step energy of reactions that doesn't really uh, occur in one step or you that you cannot measure directly by just one step like this one. Specifically, they call it the Born-Haber cycle, okay? So Haber here is the one that is uh, <clears throat> credited for the production of ammonia, Fritz Haber. So the process of finding the lattice energy indirectly from other thermochemical reactions is called a Born-Haber cycle. And born Hebel cycle is just an example of this so-called Heslow. So Heslow is the process of finding indirectly the reaction or the, the energy of a given reaction by doing operations on the different thermochemical reactions. So you will learn about thermochemical reactions when we go to chapter six, which is the last chapter. Okay, we don't have any calculation at least for chapter nine and chapter 10. But at least you, you, you should have an idea how you end up getting this value. Okay, remember, you obtain this value not by looking at the reaction of this going here. It's the step-by-step -step process that you have here. That's the cycle that you have, the, the Born-Haver uh, cycle. So it is useful for determining the crystal lattice or lattice energy, okay? Now, one thing that we'll take into account on how strong your ionic compound is, is this law. To tell you frankly, this is not even uh, law in chemistry. This is a law, a law in what? A natural law in what field? Anyone? Physics. Hmm? Physics. It's a law in physics. Okay. So this is the one that dictates how strong will your ionic bond will be. Okay. So they said here, ionic bond, ionic substances are typically high melting solids and there are two factors that affect the excuse me the strength of the ionic bond and they are given by the coulomb law okay so the coulomb law here you have here an f that's the forces of attraction that you have equals to k that's a constant q1 q2 what do you think is q Anyone? Ionic charge. Huh? Ionic charge. Ionic charge. Okay, but if you're going to go with the Coulomb law, it's just a charge. Okay. But since we're dealing with uh, atoms here, we could say it's an uh, uh, what we call ionic charge. But Q is just a charge divided by R. What could be the R? Radius. Radius. So what's, what's the interpretation of this uh, law? The higher the ionic charge, the stronger is the force. So the bigger the Q value, the bigger is the F. And the smaller is the ion, the stronger is the force. Okay? So that's the thing that we have here. Whether you have a positive or a negative charge here, 
it has something to do with the magnitude, right? Just think of it as a, what we call Jedi versus Sith. Okay? The stronger the Jedi or the Sith is, the greater is the force. Okay? The, the shorter or the smaller the given ion is, okay, the weaker is the force. So now, if that is the uh, principle behind the Coulomb's law, you can now make a prediction on which we'd have a stronger force, which you can relate to a higher melting point. Okay, so the, the way that you look at it is the stronger is the force of attraction between two ions, the higher will be the melting point. So let's look at the relationship here. So let's predict NaCl versus MgO. Okay. So what can we say about NaCl? What's the charges that we have in NaCl? What's the charges of Na and Cl in NaCl? Plus one, minus one. Okay, you have a plus one, minus one. How about MgO? Plus two, minus two. It's a plus two, minus two. So if you're going to look at it itself, your magnesium oxide is double the charge on, uh, compared to the ions of the NaCl. Because the charge is double, you, you will expect the force to be four times stronger. Because what do you have there? Two times two compared to the other one that's one times one. So two times two is equals to four. So that's four times greater than one. Okay. And then in addition to that, well, let's look at the size. The size of Na plus is larger than that of Mg2 plus. Why? What's the reason? Anyone who wants to guess? Why is the size of the Na plus is larger than that of Mg2 plus? Anyone wants to guess? Hmm? Because it's on, on the left side of the table. Okay. Who else want to guess? Look at the charge that they have. One is what? Positive one and the other one is? So as more electrons than the other, so it's larger. Okay. More electrons or less electrons? No. Less electrons. Remember, this is a positive charge. An electron is a negative charge. So if you're going to look at this, you have more electrons that were lost in magnesium 2 plus compared to Na plus. OK? And then in addition to that, you have a Cl minus that is larger than an O2 minus. So the Cl minus is much greater than the Cl. Why? Because you added an electron. The O2 minus is much larger than O. But it says here, okay, the Cl minus is larger than that of O2. So what does it mean? Both the magnesium and magnesium 2 plus and oxide is smaller okay, than the one that is in the Na plus and O2 minus. So aside from the charge, which is the Q that is bigger, the MgO also have a smaller R compared the NaCl. Okay, so those two combinations will lead you to the assumption that MgO is greater than NaCl. And if you're going to look at the value of the melting point, okay, so your MgO 
would have a melting point of around 2,800 degrees Celsius compared to the melting point of sodium chloride that is only 801 degrees Celsius. So now that's the, uh, the explanation for the uh, higher melting point is the higher charge for Mg and O and the smaller radius for Mg and O or Mg2 plus and O2 minus. Is that clear? Yeah. Now, let's go on the novel gas configuration. So at the introduction of the chapter, I told you that when Na loses its electron to become Na+, plus, it assumes the configuration of neon, which is a novel gas. So when we examine the electron configuration of the main, ion, main group ions, we find that each element gains or loses electrons to attain a novel gas configuration. What can we say about the novel gas? What can you say about the group 8A elements? They're stable. Uh, that is complete. They are, somebody said the right thing, stable. Okay. So when they are stable, they don't react with other elements. Why do you think they, uh, William Ramsey named them as noble gas? What would be the root word that you use there? Anyone? Is it the gas or the noble? What did they say about noble people? They're noble important. people are what? They are important. not ordinary people, right? Do they interact with everyday people, with everyday common people? They only interact mm. with each other. Okay. Ben. Ben George. <laughs> yes. Okay, so what do you say? <laughs> they only interact with each other. They only interact with each other. Noble people with uh. other noble people. Okay. So the, the main thing why William Ramsey, the discoverer of these noble gases, called them noble gases is because they're stable. He said there are people, like, uh, they are like noble people that don't interact with common people. So when we say common people, these are the common elements. Now, the reason why they don't interact with one another is because they're stable. And their stability has something to do with their configuration. And what they found out, the elements, when they lost or gain electrons, they tend to have a configuration similar to the noble gases. So they are always have to find stability. Okay? So this is the thing. Nothing in the world that is good as being what? Stable. Okay? Do you want a, uh, do you want a professor who is stable or unstable? But do you want a president that is a stable person or unstable person? Stable. <laughs> stable. <laughs> okay. So nothing in the world is good is what we call as being stable. Right? So let's try to see if this is true. Let's look at the electron configuration and the Lewis symbol for the chloride ion. I think this is the... last thing that we can do or maybe there's a still uh, some configuration that we have so chloride ion so let's look at its what we call 
Lewis electron dot. So chlorine is what group? 7A. Seven. 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 So you put the seven dots. But we are not asked for the chlorine. We are asked for what? The one that has a negative sign. Right. So how this how can this be true? By putting a negative sign there, what do you need to put also? Extra yes, electron. electron. So you have to put an extra electron. And we can put it the way that they put the symbol there. So I'm just going to close that one. And then put the negative sign telling us that the sign is for the whole atom. Now, if we're going to write the electron configuration for that, so you have what? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, Three S two, and how do we put now the three P? Is it three P five? How many electrons in the P now? Six. Six. It's six. So this is for the chloride. So you will see the difference of the chloride and chlorine. Is that clear? Yes. Chlorine uh -huh. has 3P6. Chloride, uh, chlorine has 3P5. Chlorine has 3P6. Chloride has an extra electron compared to chlorine. Is that clear? Yep. Now, If we're going to look at some of the other representative elements, they found out some anomaly, at least in the group three to five A metals. So what they see there is they usually exhibit uh, two ionic charges. One that is equal to the group number and one that is two less than the group number. Okay? But they have an explanation on that. Okay, so the higher charge is due to the loss of both the S subshell electrons and the P subshell electrons. Now, the lower charge is just due to the loss of only the P subshell electron or electrons. That's why you could see here, tin and lead, they can have a positive four or a positive two charge in group 5A, bismuth can form positive 3 and positive 5. So this is the anomaly that you have there. Okay? But if you have a non-metals, you will see that they're consistent. This is the one that is in the borderline. Uh, metal, uh, non-metals, semi-metals or metalloids and the metals. Now what else do we need to Remember, polyatomic ions. So we, we met them during chapter two. And as we tell here, if we're going to look at the polyatomic ions, they are usually held by covalent bonds. Okay? If you're going to look at the atoms in the polyatomic ions, they are nonmetals. NO3 minus, NO2 minus, ClO3 minus, all of them are nonmetals. That's why they are held together by as a covalent bond, as a group, and that as a group, they gain or lose one or more electron. So these are just the different, let's say, anomaly that we have. So polyatomic ions, whatever the charge that they have, you don't change them. Okay. 
And the transition metals, oh, this is the more problematic one. They can form several ions, if you remember the naming. So the atoms generally lost the ns electrons before losing the n minus 1 d electrons. So what does it mean? Most of them are positive too. Why? Because you have the s orbital before you go to the d orbital. If you recall in your electron configuration, the s and the p orbitals are usually outermost orbital compared to the d orbital. Okay, so let's try to go on this one. I think I will end the lecture here. So give the electron configurations of manganese and manganese 2 plus. We can use here uh, the noble gas configuration. So we're going to look at here. You have MN versus MN2 plus. So how can we differentiate them? So maybe we can use argon. So I'm just going to write them in terms of the noble gas configuration. And how do I put this? 4s2, 3d what? 5. 3d5. Now the question now is how are you going to write manganese 2 plus? Just with the three Am I going to remove it from the D or from the S? From the D. Hmm? Look at the notes that I put there in the slide. So if I'm going to make it M and 2 plus, I'm going to remove it from the S. I tell you the S and the PR, the outer more, the outermost orbitals compared to the D. That's why most of the metals, the transition metals, they have a positive two. Because the positive two is the loss of the electrons in the S orbital. Okay? So I'll end chapter nine for today here. But we still have a lot to do. I just want uh, to open up the session to, let's say, the, the chapter four. So question. I don't have any. At least for chapter nine before we go to chapter four. There's a quiz between the today and before next meeting. It will be in Press, the- I have a question. I have a question, but it's regarding the exam. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering as to how many questions are on the exam. What, how the? Questions are on the exam. Well, it's a typical one that we have discussed already in some of the quizzes that we have. I'm trying to open the reviewer. And, and you said what day was that? Was it going to be? First day next week. First day next week? Yeah, that's the exam. 
Okay, thank you. So this is the coverage of your second exam. So the questions are going to be very similar to this? Yeah. I don't want to say word for word they are the same because I already learned my lesson when you say similar. They said, oh, that means the same question that will be asked here will be the one coming out. Of course not, okay? But if you're going to look at the principles that being asked here, that's the one that's going to be asked. So maybe here, which of the following is a strong acid? And then I'm just going to change the answer there with another strong acid. So at least you have an idea where you start. So if there's a question of a strong acid there, oh, most likely you have a question that will come out, okay? It's on uh, respondents, right? Huh? It's on uh, respondents? No, the quiz that we have today until Thursday before class is respondus. We don't have a quiz anymore or that is not respondus until the exam because I'm preparing you now for the exam. So we have a quiz on chapter seven and eight. So it's a 10, uh, 10 uh, what do you call this, true or false question. And then you're going to have a chapter, not a chapter, uh, a review, uh, uh, not really a review, uh, an exam, dry, exam to dry run between Thursday and Tuesday. Okay. Can we go over rewriting net ionic so equations? Huh? Can we go over writing net ionic equations? Okay, sure. So what do we have in the net ionic equation? So what we have there is just writing. What are the uh, species that are involved in your reaction? So let's say the one that you have in your lab. What is experiment for that you have? Barium chloride reacting with? Sulfate. What's the one that you use? Sodium sulfate? So this is, that's the limitation that I have right now. I don't have my pen. I lost my uh, writing pad pen. So I have to do it by scrolling using my finger, okay? So how are we going to write the net ionic equation for this reaction? So this will break down into ions, but the one that you only have is what? Barium two plus and so that's AQs. You see how hard it is to, for me to write the thing. So this is AQs. And then when they form, you form barium sulfate. Which is a solid. So what, what's the principle that you need to know? Is it the uh, double replacement? 
Is it a double replacement? What principle do you need to know to predict what's the product is? Solubility. The solubility rules. Okay. So as of now, you should memorize it. And I'm sorry, I just wanted to really make sure. Did you say it was next Tuesday or Thursday? The exam is Thursday. Thursday, thank you so much. October 22. It's in the syllabus in case you're doubt, uh, in doubt of it. <laughs> okay. So I think I have a question there in the thing. Where's that? Number here, number 12. How are you going to answer number 12? Which of the following compounds is soluble in water? Memorize solubility rules. Okay, so what would be the answer there? B. So if you're going to look at here, C is out because we just answer it and it's not soluble. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the only one that is possible here is B. Why? We have a statement there, group 1A are soluble. Mm -hmm. What is the group 1A there? Potassium. Potassium. So how about the second one here, the 13? So when sodium chloride and lead nitrate react in AQ solution, which of the following terms will be present? Which of the following terms will be present in the balanced chemical uh, molecular equation? So the way that you're going to do is you're going to write the molecular equation here. So if you're going to look at this NaCl plus PBNO3. So the way you do PBNO3 is PB close parenthesis NO3 and then uh, open parenthesis NO3 and then close parenthesis 2. And then the way that you're going to have there, you're going to form what? PBCL2 and NaNO3. So 2NaCl plus PBNO3 uh, producing PBCl2 and 2NaNO3. So what's the answer that we have there? I think the answer would be letter D. 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 It's letter D. Okay, so you can only answer them if you're going to write the equation, the whole equation of that thing. So question on that? Um, so you, there's a, like a solid to confuse us in a sense? No, you, you form a solid PBCL2, but it's up to you. What's the form of PBCL2? The lead chloride is a solid because all chlorides are soluble except lead, mercury, and silver. But it's up to you to write what is the right uh, PBCL2. And, uh, and also, you, you only write one PBCL2. That's not two PBCL2. This is the right uh, PBCL2. What makes it wrong is you put the two there. The way that you have the reactions like this, 
So maybe I can type it for you. So you have their PBNO3. Reacting with NaCl. And what does it produce? PBCl2 plus NaNO3. So what is the one that's missing here? This should be 2. This should be 2. And then you put what? The AQs there. The AQs there. AQs there. And what do we have here? Solid. Yes. So that is the reaction for that question. So the one that's being asked is which of them are there? Um, could you work out uh, problem 23 on the review? So I, I would suggest you go over this one, okay? Because don't expect me to go, do it one by one because what's the point of posting them? And you know, I, can, I, I don't even, I even have the right not to go over them. Why? Because if you're going to look at the heading, okay? Look at the heading that we have the reviewers. want to make sure we're in the reviewer so what do you see there exam to reviewer and then you have their exam to reviewer solution so when you open them what number do you want danny danielle 23 yeah i have a short explanation on that thing so i think this is the one that it says there So this is the hap reaction that you have. Take one of the hap reaction and determine the energy loss or gain. So two MnO4 producing Mn2 plus. So that means you have what? From 14 to positive four, okay? So there's a 10 electron gain. I wonder what's the question all about. So I would suggest when we meet on Thursday, you go over already the reviewer solution. I mean, the reviewer and the reviewer solution. And if it's still not clear to you, then that's the time that you ask. Okay? Because I cannot feed all of you. You have to feed yourself. And it, 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 if you still ha have a hard time digesting the food that you feed yourself, that's the time I'm going to help you. Is that clear? Yep. Because you cannot tell me what will be the one that coming out because I told you I inputted there around 500 questions. And all of you will receive different set of questions. But the only thing that is the same there is each of these questions pertain to a particular principle. So if you're going to look at the 23 there, so the question Daniel asked is, what is? Determine the number of electrons involved in this reaction. So you just want to determine how many electrons were exchanged. I have not looked at the exam yet. Because I have to talk with the other faculty teaching the course. But again, it will be over 100 items. So it can be uh, concept questions that are what? Three to four points and then calculations that can go from three to eight points or three to six points. The owl today was due at uh, five. But the owl next week will be due at 12. 
because I want to cover everything during our last meeting before the exam. Okay. I, I want you to train yourself that you learn something. And the reviewer is a very good start. Another thing that you need to look on is the owl. Okay. So if you don't understand the thing, all uh, what we call recording uh, that we have is already posted. I have to make the YouTube uh, public because when I make it private, even I cannot go into it un unless I'm logged in in my YouTube account. Okay, so I, I hope that I like to thank one of your classmates who told me about this problem. So I hope you, you, you should be able to what we could go over the lecture. Yeah, we're allowed to view it and it's all good. Um, I was just wondering, so will you continue uh, posting the lectures on the YouTube? Yeah, or? yeah. This, uh, this thing, after it, what we call the record, give me maybe until 5 o'clock because what I do, I have to download the video and then I have to upload it in the YouTube. Oh, wow, okay. Because okay, thank if, you. If I leave it at Zoom, after two weeks, it's gone. Yeah, I know. I realized that. So I told you yeah. that like last so week. The, yeah. the thing that I did is everything is now in that YouTube thing. But we're the only one who knows that channel. I have to make it public because if I make it private, you cannot go in. <laughs> even I cannot go in, if, even if I know the link. I have to log in in my YouTube uh, account for me to log, to, to, to see the, the videos. Okay? So everything is there now. So if you if you are not able to understand it the first time around, maybe the second time around you will understand, because that's what I I usually do when I watch the movie. When I watch them again, I learn something that I did not uh, what we called uh, understand during my first viewing. Because I want at least the seventy six students to, to 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 remain as is, but. I'm worried that not all of you will make it because some of you have already problem with the lab. And I don't know how to deal with your problem in the lab because it's written there. If you don't submit three lab reports, you fail the course. Okay, so I leave that to you. Because honestly, I tell you, as much as possible, no one fails my course, but there's always someone who failed the course. And the main reason is not because of me, because they failed the lab. Any more question? So if we're going to recall chapter four, we started with the concept of this, what we call electrolytes, right? So we say electrolytes, these are anything that form ions. And we have what? Strong electrolyte, weak, ele weak electrolytes, and non-electrolytes. So when we say strong electrolytes, they undergo 100% uh, dissociation, like ionic compounds. The salt, when you dissolve them, they form into a positive and a negative charge. Another strong electrolytes are the strong acids and strong bases. When you put them in water, they dissociate 100%, but they are not ionic compound. They are covalent compound, but they behave like ionic compound. Now, weak electrolytes, a, a certain amount of them dissociate. So if you put them in the, the lamp test that we have, they, they glow a little bit, but not as bright or intense as the strong electrolytes. So weak electrolytes are weak acids and weak bases. And then we have the non-electrolytes. So these are the ones that don't form ion. They don't dissociate when you dissolve them in water. And then we go to this, uh, what we call solubility rules. So based on the solubility rules, we predict whether we form a precipitate or not. And then from that, we have the molecular equation, the total ionic equation, and the net ionic equation. 
So even though they, they are what we call the ionic compound, we write them just like just like they are molecular. And following the solubility rules, we can predict which one will remain AQ or AQs and which one will form solid. Okay? Because that's one type of the reaction that we have, the precipitation reaction. And then we also discuss about these spectator ions. There are ions that you can find in both reactant and product sites from the word itself, spectators. They don't uh, interact or they, they are not involved in the reaction. They are just their spectators, okay? but they don't participate in the reaction. So the difference between the total ionic equation and the net ionic equation is you lose the spectator ions. Okay? And then we go to the acid base reaction. So what did you learn about the acid base? You know the strong acids. There are what? Seven of them. HCl, HBr, HI. HNO3, nitric. Uh, H2SO4, sulfuric. HClO4, which is... Uh, perchloric, and the seventh one, HClO3, which is chloric acid. Okay, anything that doesn't belong on the seven, okay, are weak acids. Strong base, all soluble group 1A and group 2A hydroxides. Those are not uh, belong there, they are weak base. And then what else? Redox reaction. So how do we know the redox reaction? You still remember the Leora and the Geroa? Oxidation, you lose electron. Okay. Reduction, you gain electron. So you could just say all rig. Or, or oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. Okay. And then you are asked to put this so-called oxidation number. So how do we define this oxidation number? If we have element or atoms in elemental form, the oxidation number is equals to what? Anyone? Zero. 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 Okay. If you have a charge, the oxidation number is equals to the charge. Okay. Uh, hydrogen would always have plus one unless it's a hydride, which makes it negative one. Oxygen in the form of oxide will always be two minus unless it's in the form of peroxide, which makes it negative one. And if you're going to add all the oxidation number in a given compound, like a polyatomic anions or ions, okay, the total number of charge is equal to the charge of the electron. So you expect at least one question there about what's the oxidation number. Okay. And then you're given the redox reaction. You should be able to identify which is one is oxidized, which one is reduced. And then what is the oxidizing agent? So the one that is reduced, that's the oxidizing agent. The one that is oxidized, that's the reducing agent. That's why we have the Leora and the Geroa. And the later part of this, if it's not mistaken, are the calculation. Okay, I want you to go over the question that you have in your quizzes. How to get molarity. How to get the mass if the molarity and the volume are given. Okay, I want you to go over this part here that I, uh, what we call posted. I update it. Unfortunately, since I lost my pen, I was not put the chapter seven yet. This recorded slide that we have here, I updated this chapter four problems that we have. So I'm trying to share it to you. So if you have the time, please go over them. So the way that you do it, slideshow, and then you can go from current slide. Polarity 
So once I get my pen, I'm going to finish chapter seven, calculation. Okay? So question. So I would suggest you take the quiz if you're ready. I'm going to open it once we're done, but I want you to take it when you're ready. You have until the time before the lecture. If you're taking the bio, please don't take it during the bio. Make it earlier. I don't want to get complained that my students are doing stuff during outside chemistry time. Okay? Question before we call it a day. So I would suggest you start studying now. Nobody came yesterday. That's the time I realized I lost my pen at three o'clock yesterday because I have a class until one. I hope you find your pen, Professor. No, I ordered already another one. <laughs> so if you don't have any question, if you have a question uh, uh, during the time that we were not in class, feel free to email me, okay? So if not, thank you very much. Stay safe. See you on Thursday. Do the quiz before we meet on Thursday, okay? And you, you have until 5 o'clock to chapter 7. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.